Thank you. I'll step back, only one slide, because I wanted to give you a brief info. When we were planning this conference, we thought, a conference about a brain disease, Alzheimer, uh, in, a, in a place, in an event like this, it's probably worthwhile to take a step back and, and consider the big elephant in the room, right? Which is the mystery of the relationship between uh, mind and brain. Um, in 2005, Science Magazine has selected this question, this relationship between mind and brain, as the second most important unanswered question uh, in science. Back then, it is still unanswered today, and frankly, we haven't made uh, much progress. So this is what I want to talk about. Alzheimer's, perhaps more than anything else, brings to the fore that mind and brain are very tightly related. Here you have a disease that physically alters and impairs the physical brain and leads to a dramatic change in the way you subjectively experience reality and, and yourself, your, your identity. This leads many people to infer, to conclude, uh, that the brain somehow generates the mind, that the, the mind is a product of the brain, like bile is a product of the liver. Uh, but we have in neuroscience and philosophy, philosophy of mind what is known as the hard problem of consciousness, which is that we cannot, even in principle, deduce the qualities of experience from the properties of matter. We do not know how mass, momentum, energy, uh, charge, and spin leads to the redness of red, to the feeling of love, to the bitterness of disappointment. We do not know that, even in principle, that being uh, the hard problem of consciousness. Of course, there are some mainstream hypotheses today about uh, how, how this works. One hypothesis uh, is what is called the emergentist uh, hypothesis, that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain that the atoms are not conscious, that individual neurons are not conscious. But if you put enough neurons together in a sufficiently complex way, suddenly, at some point, the whole thing lights up with experience, with awareness, with consciousness. This is a bit of a stretch. It's like saying that if you put enough light switches together and interconnect them with enough complexity, that the light switches become conscious at some point uh, together. Uh, but it is not completely incoherent because there are examples of emergence in nature. The fractal shapes of snowflakes uh, are an emergent property of water molecules in the way they group themselves together uh, under low temperature. The problem is that in every known case of emergence in nature, we know how to deduce the, the emergent property from the characteristics of its components. For example, we know how to deduce the fractal shape of snowflakes from the characteristics of water molecules. We can even simulate this in a computer and generate the fractal shapes of snowflakes. But in the case of experience, of consciousness, we cannot make that deduction, even in principle. So to say that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain is the mere labeling of an unknown. It's something we do not know, we do not understand, we do not know even how to think about it, but we gave it a name, and it makes us feel comfortable that we have a grip on it. Uh, alternatively, it's an appeal to magic. We do not know what's happening there, we gave it a name, it's an appeal to magic. Another hypothesis is that consciousness is an illusion, and this is taken seriously by some people. Uh, they say that we just compute that we are conscious, but we really aren't. Well, I would challenge you to think about this. If it's an illusion, who is it who is having the illusion? If I experience an optical illusion, it's an illusion in the sense that it's not part of consensus reality, but, but I still experience it. If anything, illusions prove that consciousness exists, because consciousness is the only place where an illusion can exist. So the mainstream hypothesis today can be reduced to either absurd, the labeling of an unknown, or an appeal to magic, and that's the current situation, uh, amazingly enough. So what I wanted to do with you today is to Take a step back. Let's consider this from the beginning, and let's stick to what we do know. We do not know that brain function generates consciousness. We find correlations between them, but we do not know it. What we do know is that the brain is the second-person perspective of experience. I have the experience of seeing 500 people in front of me today, here. The second-person perspective of that experience, from your point of view, is my brain. 
My brain is what my first-person experience looks to you or to other people who are not me. That's what we do know. These things are two views of the same phenomenon, my experience and the brain, first- and second-person perspectives. But the brain is a physical system like the rest of the universe. It's composed of atoms, force fields that hold it together, just like the universe. So a natural inference, stay with me here, a natural inference is that there is a first-person perspective for the universe at large as well. That there is something it is like to be the whole universe, just as there is something it is like to be your brain, namely you. Am I the only one that is proposing this as a hypothesis? Absolutely not. Mainstream uh, physicist uh, Liz Moling from the Perimeter Institute wrote a book two years ago in which he basically acknowledges this. He says consciousness is the intrinsic aspect of the brain, and perhaps the whole, uh, the whole universe has an intrinsic aspect, since we can't uh, explain why the brain specifically can generate uh, consciousness. And then you might say, well, Bernardo, the universe is composed of these loose chunks of matter floating in space. It doesn't look at all like an interconnected brain. Remember, however, that we are in a very tiny part of the universe. The equivalent to this is if I were a microscopic little man sitting on the edge of a synaptic cleft, watching these loose neurotransmitter molecules floating around and connecting to receptor sites. I would say, oh, just loose chunks of matter. No interconnect, no brain. But if I zoom out, I see a brain. What would we see if we zoomed out and would look at the universe from at a very uh, large scale? We would see this. This has been computed. We would see what you see here on the left side. The universe at the largest scales looks surprisingly like a nervous system. It's like a universal nervous system. And before you say, well, this is just an image comparison, it can be very misleading, there have been mathematical studies looking at the pattern of interconnections and clusterings, and the conclusion was there are unknown laws behind the way the universe grows and, and, and comports itself that make it look and behave like a nervous system, like a brain, like a human brain. This has been published. So you might say, well, if this is all happening in one big mind, which I call mind at large, why do I have a separate life? Why do I not know what you are feeling? Why do I seem separate from everything else? There are many clinicians uh, amongst you, and you certainly have heard of a condition. I I'm getting into speculative territory here, but I want to convey an intuition to you. This is more an attempt to pass an intuition than a proposal of any form of theory. You probably are familiar with dissociative identity disorder, in formerly called multiple personality disorder, in which one person, one psyche, can split into multiple different personalities, so separate, and they are called alters, by the way, each personality. They are so separate that sometimes one alter wants to hurt another. Probably many of you have had experience with this. And alters take turns in time, controlling the physical body of the person, so to say, metaphorically speaking. Space-time is an integrated unit, so the intuition I want to convey to you is dissociative identity disorder in time and space at the level of mind at large. And the hypothesis is what we call life may be a dissociative process in this universal mind, in this mind at large. And what we call living beings are the images of this dissociative process. And because it is dissociative, you think you have a private inner life separate from everything else. We are today in a position that we can put a person with DID in a, in a functional brain scanner, an fMRI, and find the images of processes, neural processes in the brain that correlate with dissociation, these dissociative neural processes in yellow there. If the universe at large is like a nervous system, the hypothesis is, can we find these dissociative processes in mind at large in the universe? And what I would like to propose to you, yes, we can find it, and we don't even need a brain scanner because we are inside the universe. It's not protected by a skull that we need to pierce through. Look around you, and you can make a diagnosis. There are 500 dissociative processes in this room, perhaps many more if you count all the little critters uh, that don't have human minds. 
This is the intuition I want to convey, a way of thinking about the universe, which I think is very parsimonious, empirically honest, and very, very logical, and resolves a bunch of problems, including the hard problem of consciousness. So in a nutshell, if you stare at the stars or the inanimate universe at large, what you are seeing is the image of known dissociative processes in mind at large mental processes that also have a first-person perspective and appear to you as a dissociated alter as the inanimate universe. And living beings are your perspective, your view of this little dissociative process within mind at large, just like you do a diagnosis when you look at a functional brain scanner. Now, and that's a big step, but it follows rigorously from this. All processes in mind at large all inanimate processes, are, by definition, mental. There's nothing outside mind. And all the views of an outer, like the way I experience the outside world, are also experiences. They are mental. So, if we insert this idea of dissociation, we avoid having to infer a universe outside consciousness, and we can explain everything in terms of experience, non-dissociated, and dissociated experience alone. And the hard problem vanishes, because the hard problem arises only when we infer something fundamentally unprovable outside consciousness. This is an inference from consciousness, mind you. And then we try to explain consciousness out of that inference from consciousness. We are just chasing our own tails at light speed here. This is not going to go anywhere. It's much simpler to say, don't make that inference. This is all in consciousness, and there are dissociated and non-dissociated perspectives. That's all there is to it. Is this scientific? In 2005, uh, Professor Richard Conharry, a very respected mainstream professor out of Johns, Hop Johns Hopkins, he reviewed the results of a number of recent physical physics experiments uh, at that time. You see, if the universe were outside consciousness, there would be some implications that we can test under laboratory conditions. And they have been tested, and the results contradict the hypothesis that it is outside consciousness. And Con Henry was fed up with people trying to deny that, and he wrote this article for Nature magazine, the most respected scientific magazine in the world. And he just stated outright, the universe is entirely mental, bite the bullet. Try to stop saving the illusion. This is how things are. And he closed it in a quite spectacular way. He even used the S word, which I usually try not to use. He went as far as using that word. What has happened since 2005? There have been many more, more sophisticated experiments in physics along this direction. And I don't want to just throw uh, uh, arcane literature at you, but I want to impress upon you that these are real things. These experiments are being done, and they consistently show that uh, it's very hard to keep this idea that there is anything outside conscious observation at all. The, the universe doesn't seem to work that way. It violates every implication that you would logically derive uh, from that hypothesis. And I, I'm coming at this from a logical, empirical perspective. Uh, th there are people who can simply they have the innate ability to experience the entire world as mental. Fred Matzer, who organized this conference, is an example of a person who has that skill, which, frankly, I envy. Uh, for them, this whole discussion is like, why do we need this? Isn't this on your face? Isn't this so, so clear? And it, the evidence is leading precisely in that direction, uh, as it turns out. Now the key point, implications for what you care about, which is healthcare. Uh, I will speed just a, quick, uh, just a little bit here. If the universe is mental, then my body, your body, are images of mental processes. It can't be anything else, because there is nothing outside mentality. There are two types of mental processes that we know of. One are the neurocorrelates of consciousness that we can measure in our brains. They correspond to our ordinary self-reflective awareness. We also have, have subconscious neuro uh, 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 mental processes. My claim is that the image of our dissociated subconscious mental processes is the physical body. The physical body is the image of subconscious mental processes. 
So your mental health is not only connected to your physical body, it is your physical body to a large extent. And of course, your physical body is a dissociated process that emerges from mind at large. If you change your mental attitude and you allow that change to sink into the subconscious levels of your psyche, they will be sinking into your body. There is nowhere else for them to sink in. And they say, well, drugs and surgery, Bernardo, you know, if I crack open your skull and I slice your brain, your subjective experience of reality will change. Or if I give you a psychoactive drug, your subjective experience of reality will change. Doesn't that prove that you are wrong? No, only if you assume some form of dualism. If the entire universe is mental, drugs and surgery are the images of non-dissociative mental processes. And the fact that they change your experience of reality is no more surprising than the fact that your thoughts can change your emotions, or that your emotions can change your thoughts. Different types of mental processes exert an influence on each other. There is no surprise that drugs and surgery are effective. They come from the non-dissociated part of this whole thing. So there are two avenues, I think, for healthcare. One is the one you guys are all used to, which is the, the, the mainstream view today comes from the non-dissociated aspect, drugs and surgery, physical intervention in the body. But the mental processes of your body are also connected to your ordinary awareness. You can affect them by changing something in your ordinary awareness and letting it sink into, sink into the body. And this has been known forever. This is no news. Talk therapy, uh, meditation, prayer, visualization, suggestion. If you have ever asked yourself, why does the placebo work so tremendously well? well Try to think about it from, from this perspective. It, it's not surprising at all. Um, complementary medicine is mostly based on this psychosomatic channel that tries to reach the body through ordinary awareness as opposed to, to through the non-dissociated, inanimate uh, aspects of reality. I want to uh, state at least it's a personal statement I would like, I'd like to make clearly, since there has been so, ma so much discussion leading up to, to this conference. Complementary medicine isn't Quakery. It is based on very rational, empirically honest, in other words, things that match with what we observe and the results of experiments, and the notion of mind at large, which is also very parsimonious. It avoids the hard problem of consciousness and postulates less crazy theoretical entities that we can't prove. There's nothing Quakery about this. I mean, Deepak has been talking about this literally since I was in kindergarten. Um, clearly, I'm not uh, that old, hopefully. Uh, but he has been talking about this forever, and Deepak is not that old either. <laughs> He's older than he looks, by the way. <laughs> Sorry to let out your secret, uh, Deepak. Uh, Deepak even talks about cosmic consciousness, which is his term for what I have been calling mind at large, what Richard Con Henry would have called uh, the mental universe. And if, even if you think cosmic consciousness is, is bad taste as, as a word, he didn't invent it. You know, cosmic consciousness is a word first used in mainstream psychiatry by a doctor called uh, Richard Maurice Buck in a book of case studies of uh, patients who gained this first perspective of mind at large. At that time, it was a mystery for psychiatry. He wrote a case studies book in 1901, and he titled it Cosmic Consciousness. You can't blame Deepak even for that name, which I think is a very appropriate name, by the way. It's highly descriptive and accurate. Um, so, leading up to this conference, all the discussions that had, the thought I want to leave you with is that, you know, he who loves last, loves harder. And I'll just let you digest this. And uh, if you want to know more about everything I talked here about today in a short space of time, uh, I have a book that has just been published. It's available online. Uh, I hope this has been uh, useful. Thanks very much. <laughs>